So good morning, everybody. How are you all doing? I'm going to make you do that again. How's everybody doing this morning? Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so on behalf of KPCC and LAist, welcome to our Crawford Family Forum for this morning's program. Uh, my name is John Cohn. I manage and oversee live programming events for KPCC and LAist. Uh, we have a range of things that we do, as you saw on the screens prior to the event, so I won't ramble through those. If you want to be on the newsletter to be the first to find out, get access to ticketing discounts, whatever, sign up for our KPCC in-person newsletter at kpccinperson.org. Um, we do a range of stuff, but we're always thrilled when it comes back to the heart of what we do, um, with part of our public service journalism, public service journalism, and to have an opportunity to be able to partner with groups in town like the Los Angeles Times, which is what we're doing today, and we're honored to be part of uh, Press Freedom Week. Um, so thank you for joining us for this and what I am sure will be an enlightening and, and vital and important conversation when we talk about journalism. Uh, just a quick bit of housekeeping. We are live video streaming, audio capturing, so please no recording of any kind. We got that covered and it'll be accessible after the event. Uh, photos are okay, but please no flash and no loud heckling. There will be an opportunity for a Q&A session uh, that Megan Garvey will uh, sort of facilitate in all of her expertise. So there will be an opportunity for people to interact with, with our program participants today. So you didn't come here to hear me talk. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to your host for today, uh, our executive editor, Megan Garvey. <clears throat> So uh, good morning. I'm used to being heckled, so I could probably take it if you uh, cannot resist the urge. I'm going to call Jeff Glasser and Katie Townsend up and introduce you guys to them. The first part of this discussion, we're going to talk to Katie and Jeff. They are both attorneys who do a lot of the hard work to make information accessible to journalism. We had a story a few weeks ago um, about alleged harassment by a restaurateur in Los Angeles. And one of the things that someone tweeted, which I, I like to see, was, you know, congratulations to our newsroom for publishing the story, but also a thanks to the attorneys that this person knew were behind the ability to publish in the first place and allow us to do it in a way that was responsible and protected us from, you know, litigation or other issues, making sure we get everything fair. So Jeff Glasser is to my left is the general counsel of the Los Angeles Times and the San Diego Union Tribune. He heads the company's legal department, so he handles a lot of the newsroom issues, including litigation, intellectual property, contract law, commercial matters. And he's also represented the LA Times and the San Diego Union in a lot of legislative and policy matters in both California and Washington, D.C. He's a board member and chair of the Governmental Affairs Committee for the California News. Publishers Association, and he's the co-chair of the Media Law Resource Center's California chapter, and a member of the Legal Affairs Committee for the News Media Alliance. Wow, Jeff. No wonder you don't come to dinner very often. <laughs> Lots of civic activities. <laughs> Before jumping fully into the, in, into like a, as a general counsel of a, of a news organization, he practiced law at Davis Wright Tremaine. And he also worked as a senior editor at US News and World Report, and he served as Bob Woodward's researcher on the book Shadow, Five Presidents and the Legacy of Watergate, and I've known Jeff a very long time. And it's nice to see you. Megan. Only fought with him on occasion <laughs> <laughs> about things. And I just met Katie, so she's a new friend. Katie is the legal director of the Reporters Committee for the Freedom of the Press. It's, that's a nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C., and she oversees litigation, amicus, and other legal work of the Reporters Committee attorneys, and she represents the committee in a whole bunch of different ways. She's an advocate for a free press and for access to information. She, um, you know, we, we were talking in New Orleans at the Online News Association where she was, and so she's a real advocate out there trying to make sure that we have access to all the information, not just in California, but across the country. And I'm gonna talk to her a little bit about how California fits into that overall national scene and, you know, where we are in terms of access to information in general in the United States, which has been sort of an interesting time to be both a journalist and a citizen. So, so I, I wanted to start by saying we were talking a little bit upstairs about this trajectory of access to information when it comes to how police conduct, and we do at KPCC, we try to say conduct, because it's not just 
when police act in ways that are inappropriate because most of the time officers do their job well and you know are acting within the law and are serving their purpose of protecting and serving the public which is why I think a lot of people become police officers so I think that in this group there's a lot of respect for what sworn officers do in their jobs but that said I think that there's also a belief that the public has a right to understand and know how officers do their job and when officers aren't doing their job well. And it was really interesting to me, a few years ago, Doug Smith, who has a longer memory than I have, um, he's a longtime reporter at the LA Times, did a really interesting story about how it wasn't all that long ago in California and in LA in particular, where not only did we have access to information about police conduct, there were even public inquests where, where members of the public could even ask questions about what had happened in particular incidents, which is a far cry from what happened in the 1970s and how that information, that, that aperture got very, very small and then almost entirely closed. So I want to just have Jeff talk a little bit about why I think a law that was intended to preserve records ended up in a situation where California became so secretive. So in the 1970s, a bunch of uh, police agencies were destroying records. And um, the legislature came together and they created a process which is known as the Pitches process um, where they were able to preserve records of, um, that reflected on police conduct. Um, but as part of that law, they said that personnel records were confidential to the public. And then the concept of what was a personnel record became very expansive over the decades and was heavily fought over. Um, so this, the Pitches statutes existed from the mid-1970s, uh, and they still exist, but they were obviously amended last year to give us some um, ability to see what happens with police shootings and with certain misconduct. But I think the idea was that you needed these records, particularly if there were going to be um, criminal prosecutions, uh, that both sides needed access to these records and the records were not being preserved. And so the idea of the Pitches laws was to make sure that litigants could have the ability to access them, although the general public did not. Then in the early 1980s, um, you had another law uh, about investigative records and um, a law passed saying you could get investigative records and Governor Duke Medjian vetoed that law. And the next year, there was a compromise um, done between the various stakeholders, the transparency groups and the police groups. And that said, you cannot get access to investigative records in California, um, but you can get the substantive information, the factual circumstances about incidents investigated by police. And that was the compromise that they came up with, but that meant that you can't even get a police report in California the way you can in a lot of states like Florida. And so for years and years, we didn't have a lot of access to records, and it got worse. In 2006, in the Copley Press decision, um, the California Supreme Court cut off access to uh, citizen review board investigations, which previously had been public, and the LA Times and other publications had used the access to those kinds of proceedings for very important reporting, including the Rampart reporting. Um, and that was then shut off. Um, but the police unions continued to litigate and to try to narrow the circumstances in which you could get access to law enforcement records. And then the tide started to turn. So in 2007, in the Post decision, the California Supreme Court said you can get the names of police officers. They're not personnel records. And in 2014, in a case I was involved in, the California Supreme Court said in the Long Beach Police Officers Association case that generally the names of police officers involved in shootings are not confidential under California law. And then there was a case by the Court of Appeal um, involving Pasadena, the city of Pasadena, where there was some access to a consultant's report 
that the city of Pasadena had commissioned that was vigorously fought by the various parties. And um, I've, the report was mostly released to the public eventually after litigation. I, along the backdrop of all of this, technology changed. And in 2015 and 2014, people started taking videos of everything on their phones. And at first, a lot of police agencies in California didn't want to release um, footage of the dash cam video or the body cam video or other video that they had, particularly in certain places in Southern California. And um, the only way that you could get access to that video because of the investigative records exemption was to go to federal court, which doesn't recognize necessarily state law privileges, and to argue if somebody brought a civil rights lawsuit that we should get access to the video. And so in 2015, one of the most read stories on LATimes.com was uh, a video of the shooting of several unarmed individuals in Gardena. Um, they were on bikes. They were on bikes, yeah. And, and people were kind of outraged. And then the Black Lives Matter movement became very prominent around the country and in California with various shootings. And it galvanized Sacramento last year during the Clark shooting, after the Clark shooting up there. Um, uh, legislators decided that they wanted to act and to change the law. And so they amended the Pitches statutes that I mentioned. And in certain specified circumstances, uh, they are now giving us um, access to these records. And so just real quickly, the, the, you can get access to shooting records now, all shootings, whether or not it's considered to be a good shooting or a bad shooting. You can get access to records involving great bodily injury by a Although there's a some disagreement officer. about what that is. So <clears throat> we're going to have litigation over what constitutes um, great bodily injury, although there is a lot of law saying that it's you know a substantial and serious injury. So a knee scrape is not going to qualify. A broken bone probably is going to qualify. But that will be fought over. And then sustained um, cases involving sexual assault by peace officers against members of the public. And sexual assault is broadly defined. So if a police officer propositions a member of the public while on duty, that qualifies under the definition of sexual assault that would be subject to this, but not sexual harassment of by an officer against another officer. The idea was that this, these, they wanted to make public interactions between police officers and members of the public. And so the other category would be about um, sustained findings regarding dishonesty it, but dishonesty not about like your timesheets as a police officer. It's dishonesty about the way that you testify or the way that you write the police report. Um, so you know if you falsify uh, a report and, or splash taco sauce instead of blood as uh, something that the LA Times has written about, that kind of thing would be disclosable under this law. I just wanted to circle back to something that Jeff said when he talked about access to like, the circumstances around discipline. So the window, the one window that was left open, you know, for until 2006 was, let's say, you know, I'm officer, you know, uh, Jane Smith, and I do something that gets me in trouble. And they decide that they're going to suspend me without pay for 60 days. And I appealed that suspension. I said, I, I think I've been treated unfairly. At that point, the, the sort of a lot of the investigative um, material that went into that finding would then become available, right? So the one place you could look was in the county, for example, at the Civil Service Commission. And you could go and you could see those files. And in fact, I was telling them earlier, I vividly remember right before 
they shut the window on all those. So any sworn officer, any kind of a sworn officer, which includes not just you know, sheriff's deputies like we think about, but also school police, university police, there's all kinds of investigators that are sworn. You had access to that information. I remember going with Robin Fields, a friend of mine, um, who's now at ProPublica, and we actually bought an early version portable Xerox machine, and we lugged it over there, and we sat there and we copied those records, because we knew we were never gonna get, they were gonna go away potentially forever. And we held on to those so that at least, and I was at the LA Times at the time, at least when something happened, when they did release the name of an officer involved in a shooting, which that had been litigated as well, we at least had a reference point so we could go and see if we had this small window into whether this officer had been in trouble before. And, and that's sort of the situation we were in. I mean, at KPCC, we had a podcast called Repeat, which looked at repeat shooters in the Sheriff's Department. And one deputy that Annie Gilbertson, you know, who hosted and reported the series, tried to investigate, had shot, I believe it was like four people within seven months or something. Most officers go their entire lives without ever being involved even in a shooting. So this was an extraordinary set of circumstances. And she goes through this whole rabbit hole and ultimately really can't tell you much at all about how they investigated those shootings or whether they had in interviewed witnesses in a way that was substantial. And so you have someone who is an outlier within sort of the ecosystem of law enforcement and no ability really to know whether even the department itself had done a thorough investigation and very little access to do one ourselves. And so that's when we get to SB 1421 and a set of circumstances where I think the very powerful police unions, you know, who, who I think had the ear of Sacramento for many years and argued that they had a right to privacy, is in a situation where a lot of the public is now seeing, whether it's personal cell phone videos or instances where the story that was told by police, whether it's in Chicago mm -hmm. with Laquan McDonald or mm -hmm. other cases, um, the story that is told does not match up with what becomes publicly available. And then I think it starts to shift some. And Katie, I think, can you talk a little bit about what you've seen in the last several years in terms of sentiment about how much access we should have to information about about police records. Yeah, and I think the, the sort of trajectory or the pendulum swing that Jeff described here in California from sort of access to secrecy sort of now swinging a little bit back more towards access um, is really something that's playing out across the country. Um, you know, to put it in a little bit of context though, uh, California along with New York, um, precisely because of what Meg describes, which is very powerful police unions with a lot of sway um, in, in the state capitals, um, they happen to have, or or did have, I think, before recent changes here in California, um, some of the most restrictive access laws when it comes to access to police disciplinary or police personnel records. Um, that surprises people sometimes. Yeah, I mean, you um, think of California and New York as being sort right. of liberal states, exactly. open access. You know, I, I, I think it is surprising. And you see some states that you might not think that of where, like Florida, for example, is famous for access to basically, I mean, they could probably get my emails, so... And there are these restrictions, I would say the vast majority of states do have some restrictions on access to police personnel files. I would say all of them have some, um, but they vary. And there's probably about a dozen states where these kinds of records are accessible, at least when you're not talking about unsubstantiated complaints and things of that nature. Um, but going back to sort of the original question, which is, is the pendulum sort of swinging back? I think. Um, absolutely. That's something that we've seen uh, really across the country. and I. I it's a, res a direct result of exactly what you described, Megan, what, what Jeff described, which is changes in technology and high profile cases of police shootings and use of force that really galvanize the public. I think one of the examples, certainly there's the Laquan McDonald shooting. Um, is that, are people familiar with that case in Chicago? This was the uh, shooting of a young man by an officer named um, uh, Jason Van Dyke. And uh, the police report, shortly after his shooting, there was some great investigative reporting done by uh, a reporter, Jamie Calvin, um, that indicated that he, the young man had in fact been shot um, uh, 16 times, I believe, including in the back, um, which did not match up with the police report. Um, thereafter, there was another journalist who was able to get the dash cam footage from that, which many of you may have seen, and it's really, um, it's horrifying. I mean, it, it really is very striking, that footage, and it does not match up with, with the way the police described how that shooting occurred. 
In fact, Officer Van Dyke was convicted last year of, um, in, of manslaughter in connection with that shooting. And other officers, there's at least one other officer whose um, trial is still ongoing or whose criminal actions are still ongoing um, in connection with sort of covering up that shooting. So I think that made people question whether or not, um, particularly after they saw the video, whether or not these types of, um, I, I think, question trust, frankly, trust. Right, the that's police. the question, right? Like, if you believe that if the if a police officer, and I was talking to them earlier, you know, I've served, I've served on one jury, which was actually, interestingly enough, a murder trial for an off-duty police officer who shot and killed a, a young man after a traffic altercation. Um, but I've, I've been uh, voir dired before and rejected. Um, when, but they, they ask you, like, do you believe, do you believe that everything, that a police officer will always tell the truth, right? It's like you're supposed to treat police officers in court like any other person, right? You're supposed to explore their credibility um, based on the facts and, and evidence and not give them added authority because they are a sworn officer. And, and that sort of is, I think, gets at the mm -hmm. heart of whether we should have access to information about how they behave on the job. I just want to offer one counterpoint. Um, certainly there are cases where what the officer describes is not, in fact, what happened when additional evidence or video evidence comes out. And then there are other cases where it's a complete match. I mean, there was, or very close, there was a, a horrible incident in Orange County recently where a young woman, you know, um, the officer described this young woman behaving erratically and then coming at him with a weapon. And it was a very strange story. And then they released, I don't know if it was a dash cam or the body cam. Mm -hmm. and, and what the officer said was, was what happened? You know, it was the, the young woman was threatening, was warned. Um, didn't listen, um, and he he fatally shot her. And it, it's hard to see, I, I don't know, maybe there could have been a de-escalation, but certainly the description of what happened was in fact what appeared to have happened when that information was released. So there's many instances where officers have done exactly what, what they say they did. I just wanna, I mean, you know, I, I, we, we, I, we end up in this like, like sort of um, uh, adversarial role sometimes, and I don't, I think our job is to, well, you can talk a little bit about that, Jeff. Well, on, on the point of, um, I think they wanted to treat police officers more like other public employees in terms of disciplinary records. So like, so, I don't want my personnel record released, right? And you could see like how people feel like it's are private, but there's many things about working in the public sphere that are not in fact private, like your salary. So under a long body of law that goes back to the 1970s also, a public employee um, gets the records about their discipline disclosed to the public if they're asked. And that rule did not exist for sworn peace officers. And I think the legislators thought in some ways that it was unfair. And, and that was animating some of the changes that occurred last year with SB 1421. Now, I think there are more protections still in SB 1421 than there are for other public employees. But the idea being that if you're going to work for the public and you're receiving your salary and public funds, that when you are disciplined or where, when there are reasonable indicia of well-founded allegations, then you get access to those records. Mm -hmm. Katie, there's like real implications, right? So if you have, and we've seen this happen too, if you have an officer with an undisclosed history of dishonesty, right, that goes to whether you can believe them or not, mm -hmm. they're, they're sworn in court, right? They take an oath to tell the truth, like any, like any witness in court does. If, if the defense does not have that information about that attorney's history, what, what can happen to those cases in, in the long term? Well, I think, um, you know, it's, it's interesting that you, you say the defense, and I think one of the interesting things or the that prosecution, made, I was yeah. going to say in California, there's even restrictions on the prosecutor's ab avail ability to get access to that information. Um, you know, it, and, I, and I hesitate for the same reason that, that you did, Meg, to, to sort of characterize this as just simply sort of ferreting out misconduct, because I think in, in some ways, you know, transparent, or in many ways, transparency and access is important because you want to see people um, 
how, you want to see how people are doing their jobs and you want to see people doing their jobs well. And I think we assume 90% of the time, or we should percent 90% or maybe 99% of the time, people are doing the right thing. And that's important to see as well, because I don't think it's helpful to only see the examples of sort of the worst, um, the worst examples of, of police misconduct when you really should be seeing um, the full spectrum, which puts that into perspective. Um, you can see it as an outlier as opposed to sort of Ever, the, the only sort of examples that, that you see. Um, I mean, one of the, I'll, I'll just touch on the, um, I wanted to touch again just a little bit on the legislative reform piece because I think it's really, it's really important. I mean, we are seeing legislative reform efforts in other states. Um, in New York, for example, their police personnel secrecy statute, which is known as 50A, is very restrictive in terms of public access. After the Eric Garner um, killing, uh, this is the, the individual who um, was filmed by bystanders um, being put in a chokehold. He, he was selling like, loose cigarettes on the street. He's selling loose cigarettes on the street, um, and he died as a result of that. Um, I think one of the things that was was put into crystal clear focus was Section 50A, because the officer who was involved in that, Officer Daniel Pantaleo, his uh, police disciplinary history was in fact um, disclosed to the media in an unauthorized way, what we might call leaked to the media, um, but it was not available under 50A. And in fact, news organizations tried to get it under 50A and could not get it. And I think that really shone a very bright light for members of the public who wanted to know whether this officer had a history of using illegal or, unauthor or unauthorized or against policy chokeholds against other individuals. They realized you can't get that information. And I, I don't think, I think we know that, or members of the media know that, and journalists have known that for quite a long time, what kind of barrier that these laws can, can, can put up in terms of reporting on uh, incidents of real public importance, but the public had never really seen that before. Jeff, were you surprised that 1421 passed? I know other, other efforts had, had not been successful. We were very surprised. It passed by one vote <laughs> on the last day of the session. So we had introduced that legislation several times previously, the Newspaper Publishers Association with various legislators. We couldn't even get a hearing. Um, and so to have the sea change, uh, Mark Leno in his last year in Sacramento introduced the same bill and um, it went nowhere. And that was in 2016. So to have it change two years later, so incredibly was was really interesting but the politics in Sacramento changed and the legislature changed the legislature became more liberal um, and it was Nancy Skinner who authored this bill she's a legislator from Berkeley and she felt very strongly that it wouldn't be the end of the world for there to be some transparency regarding um, police misconduct and police shootings now I don't want you to think that SB 1421 is some panacea for transparency. The unions are fighting like heck to stop this bill from being effective. They filed dozens of lawsuits the day the law became effective and in the weeks afterwards, saying that it didn't apply to records um, before 2019. Then uh, you had some cities that went and destroyed records. So it's still an imperfect remedy. Um, we've had a judge down in Riverside who's delayed disclosure of a very important uh, video uh, that shows a shooting at Costco by an off-duty police officer for one year. And um, he found in his ruling that it would substantially interfere with the investigation to release the video. And the Attorney General took a, an interesting stance as well, right? The Attorney General is um, not e exactly enforcing the law. The Attorney General is fighting disclosure of records, in particular records in their possession that are of shootings by other agencies because they investigate these shootings um, and that is in the Court of Appeal in Northern California right now. Can one or both of you address this other issue that's come up? And you've heard a lot. You've heard it from um, the L.A. County Sheriff, Alex Villanueva. You've heard it from some of the smaller departments, that this is a tremendous burden on them to compile and redact 
these documents. And you'll hear from the reporters and editors in a minute, we have certainly filed a lot of requests trying to get at these documents, of course, which we couldn't, we had no access to for years. So yeah, they do feel a little bit overwhelmed. And some of the departments are saying, I'm gonna have to spend millions of dollars just to, just to comply with, with the law if it's interpreted as we, as I think, the newspaper association and other media organizations believes it should be. Does that is that a compelling argument for you? I think there are issues with um, how much it costs to comply with the law, and I think the legislature is planning to take a look at that next year. Certainly for state agencies, um, I think there's some understanding that it's creating burdens, but also uh, some of the agencies are hiding behind that to not release records. And you're seeing wide variance in compliance with the law. So in the city of Los Angeles, you're seeing the LA Police Department producing some records, putting them up online. You're seeing the LA County Sheriff's Department not producing a lot of records, saying they don't have the money that the supervisors need to allocate more money for it. And I don't think it's, I mean, I don't think, given how little access there has been, and now it's sort of a first opportunity for folks to make requests and to seek this information, I'm sure they're getting a lot of requests, and I'm sure it's for a lot of information, and that's part of the problem with having a system that isn't, um, isn't consistently open over time, because then you have to play catch up when you do have changes in the law. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily entirely sort of invented, but I agree with Jeff that it is certainly not a rationale or a basis for um, refusing to comply or arguing that the that compliance can't be done or taking a long time to comply with the law. I mean, I think, um, you know, I, the purpose of the statute is to benefit the public and ultimately these are government agencies and they should be complying with laws that are intended to benefit the public. And I should add, it's not just media organizations. Anyone mm -hmm. can, can make a request for, for this information. There are families that you know feel like they've never really gotten answers in their individual cases. Um, and I, another thing I wanted to add is, you know, despite the fact that there's been a real lack of transparency in many ways for many years here in California, that does not mean that there has not been repercussions to um, police actions. And so there have been literally like, you know, tens of millions of dollars, probably more than that even, I know more than that, paid out in civil cases where uh, the family of someone who is killed by police officers files, you know, a, a civil case. Mm -hmm. And ultimately either the jurisdiction itself decides to settle, in some cases it goes to court. So there, the lack of disclosure of the details of the case has not really prevented another cost, I think, to the public, which is like a real actual tangible writing a check for millions of dollars mm -hmm. cost in, in these cases. Is, what kind of access under civil litigation, was, was, that, a, was that a remedy really to, to not being able to get at the disciplinary records? So we couldn't get access to the records, but if they brought a case against the city or the county, then it would be in federal court and you could potentially get access to the police disciplinary records. So then what happened was you had places that were doing settlements to try to keep them out of the public eye. So then we fought in federal court to get you know, copies of the settlements so that we could say how much um, you know, people were paying for these shootings. That's how the Gardena shooting video came out. There was a settlement in that case that was a very high seven-figure settlement, and um, the judge felt that the public had a right to see the shooting video. Um, and so that used to be the only way to do that, um, and, and certainly people had redress through the criminal justice system, and they still do. Um, and that may be our best avenue for getting some records of cases that go to, to civil um, cases. It's very, very rare for a police officer to be prosecuted criminally for a shooting. So you're not gonna get police disciplinary records out of criminal court, because they just, there are very few cases. There's a sheriff's deputy involved in the shooting at the gas station. I think it was the first in more than, a, a Frank's here, was it, I think? More than a decade, Frank? Yeah, 20 years. 20 years, so, yeah. So, with, with that kind of record, really the only chance to get these 
these kinds of things is through civil court mm -hmm. and now through this law, which has certain timing restrictions. Yeah. But we spend a lot of time talking about these issues and it's exciting to see this many people come out to want to have this conversation. I have Daphne and Lynn are in the back and I want to just thank all the people who made this possible today who got this set up, including John and Daphne and Lynn and Hillary. Thank you very much for that. But we definitely wanted to open it up to you. And, and again, this part of the section we're talking about sort of the law, we're going to um, go into the journalists in a few minutes, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to ask these very you know, prominent people in the First Amendment space if you have any questions about where we're heading legally with, with this issue of access. So if you do, just raise your hand and someone will bring you a mic. Hold on one second. Just if you could talk into the mic so anyone who's watching. This is directed to you, yeah. Jeff. I'm handling a petition under the CPRA that I filed this month where the issue is the interpretation of GBI. You mentioned that there's already something you know about, and I want to make sure I'm in touch with those people because I don't want to do anything to harm that, that direction of litigation and want to be on board with it. Can you help with that respect? Sure, we can, we can talk afterwards, but I think great bodily injury issues have come up uh, in Northern California, in Sacramento, um, as to the scope of records that are being disclosed and whether, you know, they have to produce things where um, there wasn't a shooting, but it might be in between. I know we had a case, I think, in Long Beach where someone was hospitalized, you know, so you know, there was no shooting, but there was some kind of physical altercation. And they came back and basically said that there were no, you know, you know, documents in compliance. You know, they didn't have any, what is it called? I'm losing my words. No responsive documents. No responsive documents. I should have those emblazoned somewhere. Oh, is it? I was just going to add to the um, point about the access in civil lawsuits. Um, you know, it is true that uh, if a civil lawsuit is filed and documents are actually filed with the court in connection with motions, for example, that that can be an avenue to sort of get access to those materials. Um, oftentimes in litigation, if parties are just exchanging material, what we call in discovery, you may not be able to get access to that information if there's a protective order. And I think one of the things that illustrates, and of course, if there's a settlement, um, oftentimes what we're seeing with police departments across the country is that they're now requiring sort of non-confidentiality as a, as a condition of that settlement agreement. In other words, in order to settle a claim, a civil claim that a, a person is making about um, excessive use of force or something like that, they'll require that, um, that uh, victim or that plaintiff to uh, agree that they'll not speak to the media. And there was a recent challenge to this practice, actually, by a small news organization in Baltimore, the Baltimore Brew, um, and a woman who had been, uh, who was a party to one of these agreements, uh, challenging that and um, challenging her ability to actually not just speak but respond to statements that had been made by the police department, suggesting that actually she was kind of at fault. Um, she felt that she was prohibited from responding to that publicly, and so I think it shows in some ways um, that there are, uh, re you know, a. a and there's actually legislation now that's being considered um, in Maryland to make that um, impermissible, to make it impermissible for police departments to require that kind of confidentiality or gag order in settlement agreements. And we saw this with Me Too, right, where exactly. people have settled and then they, they took a risk to then speak out later. And I think exactly. there is sort of a, a backlash to um, if you could use like a monetary payment to basically silence people silence on issues money. of justice, really. Yeah. And it shows how it's a bit of a moving target. Um, I think police ac accountability and transparency is a bit of a moving target because there's not just one legislative fix under the CPRA that's going to make everything okay. I think there are there are multiple sort of la layers to it, um, and there are different legislation, different legislative fixes that can help contribute to, to more access about uh, to give us kind of the bigger picture. Thanks. My name is Courtney Raj. I'm with the Committee to Protect Journalists, and thank you for this really interesting panel. I have a question because it seems to me, um, as you know, we've done some press freedom missions around the U.S. and heard from officials that 
there's this emphasis on FOIA, on Freedom of Information Act, on these legal processes. But what about the proactive provision of information? Shouldn't there be an assumption, you know, by public officials and agencies that the information should be provided and that it should be provided in a datafied way, in a way that is um, accessible online and is potentially machine readable? I mean, Yes, that would be great. I think some laws actually require that. The Federal Freedom of Information Act, as amended in 2016, has provisions for um, affirmative, what we call affirmative disclosures. I think, um, I mean, should public agencies at the state and federal level be doing this? Absolutely, because that it serves the public's interest. And it also, I think, addresses one of the complaints that we spoke about earlier, which is the sort of burden of complying with individual requests. Well, if you know that people are going to request this information and you are maintaining it and processing it in such a way that, it, that you're affirmatively making it available, no one has to request it. And so there's a there's a sort of efficiency aspect to affirmative disclosures that I think is um, it would be it would be nice if more more state agencies were were taking seriously. I mean, I do think there are some privacy issues and some victims' rights issues that limit the ability to have such affirmative policies. Um, but certainly, uh, quantitative information can be readily disclosed without mm -hmm. public records requests. I think the trick there is whether they keep it like that, right? Because they're not required to create it for you, but they are required to release it if they keep it like that. Right. And then sort of a self-defense would be just not to keep it like that, right, if they don't want to right. disclose it. So I think we have time for maybe one more question if anyone, if anyone still has one. Then we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of uh, now that we s allegedly have access, there's one more. <laughs> what can we do with it? Okay. All right. I'm <laughs> I'm Kyle Stokes. I work here. I'm an education reporter. I just was curious to hear a little more of some of the conflicts. I mean, you were discussing the Riverside case about how there's sort of seemingly like a legitimate conflict between investigative necessity to keep records secret and then this sort of new, you know, the, the 1421 disclosure requirements. The, it'd be interesting to hear the Attorney General to be here to talk through sort of the other side. Um, and you know, I'm wondering if you can, I'm interested to know why they're fighting these disclosure and what are the grounds and I mean, can you just sort of talk us through the legal back and forth? Like what are they saying and then what do you say to that? So I, I'm not involved in the Attorney General case directly. The Reporters Committee did file an amici brief that we signed on to in that case. But my understanding is that the Attorney General um, is definitely concerned about the administrative burden. I think there is a huge number of records in their possession of other agencies, and um, it would be very difficult for them, at least that's what they're saying, to go through all of the records of those agencies. Now, the Attorney General also took the, the case of the police unions and the Attorney General said the law doesn't apply to records created before 2019, including the records held by the State Department of Justice that are their own records, not just the other agency records. And, and, and he lost in, in that. And which Nancy Skinner, the author of the bill, has clearly said was not her intent. Her intent was not only to be forward-looking. Well, the, the idea the of a record... Been, the bill could have been written better. The idea of a record, right, is that it's something that already exists from yeah. the past, right? <laughs> um, so Nancy Skinner did issue a letter saying that it was the intent of the legislature to um, apply this law to all records and not just records created uh, before 2019. Even though we've won most of these cases and we've done some of these cases with KPCC, there is still one outstanding case that is in the Court of Appeal in Ventura County. And there the public defender is um, trying to argue for access to records before 2019. And um, in that case, the trial court uh, found against the idea that the law was retroactive, even though all of the other courts across the state, including in published decision, 
by the Court of Appeal in Northern California um, said that it did apply to all records. Yeah. And as Meg alluded, I think what we're going to see with SB 1421 is a lot of fight over the legislative like language, um, which is super exciting, I know, for everyone. <laughs> everyone loves statutory interpretation. But um, I think that's what we're going to see. In the Becerra case that um, involving the Attorney General, I think the concern is, or the concern they're asserting is administrative burden, but they're also arguing that under the plain language of the statute, they're not really required to release these records. You can go, if you want them, you can go make a request to each individual law enforcement entity around around the state um, and that's what the law requires so I think because it's new and sometimes you see this with new legislation anyway um, you really fight it you're gonna have these fights that are just fighting it out over what the legislative language is um, and I think we're gonna see that in the next year a couple of years well thank you guys so much for joining us and now we're gonna really get into like the um the mess that is actually trying to do something <laughs> with these acquiring and using these records. Thank you, guys. Come on up. So it's like the murderer's row, but um, you know, uh, this whole thing really got started, this California Reporting Project, which is this really exciting collaboration between now, I think it's more than, I think we're at 41 newsrooms, uh, 40, we're still at 40, even with Ventura? Yeah, okay, 40, sorry, 40 newsrooms, wanna be accurate. Um, which is really unusual, because often we're very competitive with each other. Um, we don't usually like to share, even sometimes when we've worked together. Um, so uh, this whole thing got started with a call from I can't remember, did you call me Alex or was it Ethan? Uh, Ethan's here too, so. Um, from KQED, and let me just quickly introduce, this is Dana Amahir, she's our data editor here at KPCC and Elias, and she's been integral in um, helping us figure out once we acquire these records from all these different news organizations, how are we actually gonna find them and use them? This is uh, Jeremiah Dobrik from the Long Beach Post, a scrappy newsroom in Long Beach where there is a lot of litigation and issues around police conduct. Um, he's covered criminal justice issues for some time. I think you're, you're doing breaking news now. Yeah, uh, we're, like you said, we're scrappy. We're yeah, small. We're only a dozen scrappy. people, so yeah. a little bit of everything. Yeah, and then Alex Emsley from KQED, who um, covers criminal justice there and has been really, you know, critical to even all of us being here on stage today and certainly the effort in general. He had a big idea about uh, how we could do a lot more if we banded together. And then Jack Leonard is the senior investigations editor at the LA Times for Metro. And he's actually the guy who surprisingly said, you know, why are we going to argue about this? You know, what do, really, it's ultimately our purpose here is to serve the public. These are public records. And so instead of trying to like have our like, you know, arms around the prison meal and make sure that, you know, we're not scooping each other, which turns out not to be a problem. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, why don't we work in a truly collaborative way, which is pretty exciting. And I think, you know, we're very early days still, even though the law was passed on January 1st, we sent out hundreds of requests across our various newsrooms right at midnight. Um, but I think that we're really hoping to have a more robust sort of system to take in and then, uh, you know, disseminate out the information we're gathering. Certainly by the beginning of the year, we have a website up today. Can you give the URL for that? Yes. Visit CaliforniaReportingProject.org. Which says all of the newsroom organizations, sort of our basic principles. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, Alex, I think that the, the idea was that we knew there were going to be literally, I mean, I don't even know how many documents we potentially could get, and that any one newsroom, you know, acting alone would take basically from now until eternity, and we'd all be making the same requests, too. That's the other thing that would happen. And so why did you think maybe that wasn't the right way to go about this? Fear, I think. <laughs> I think it was fear. Um, I, I was living in a state of denial right up until September 30th of 2018 um, because I had, we touched on some of these previous efforts to open up access to these records. And as a, a criminal justice reporter who'd focused just um, exclusively on policing issues, officer-involved shootings for, for many years, um, you know, I was kind of just used to the state of, of things as they were, which is, 
you don't get this good information. luck good yeah. luck getting something you don't, right? you don't get this stuff um and and so then there was another round of this and i was i also was skeptical and even after the legislature passed the thing by by one vote i thought the governor was going to veto it um so on september 30th i had this uh realization this law has been signed it's going to take effect january 1st and we're really going to have access to a whole lot of newsworthy information that is in the public interest that can show us things that we haven't seen before, certainly in 40 years, but I, I would argue ever in California. And um, we have an obligation to do something about that, but it was way too big to even really conceive of. You were asking if I called you. I didn't. I talked to my boss, Ethan Lindsay. So Ethan called me. Where, where do we scope this thing? Yeah, <laughs> I'll blame Ethan. I blame Ethan. Well, yeah. How do we scope this thing? And I got to uh, give a shout out to my closest colleague in our newsroom, Suki Lewis, mm -hmm. as well, who's an investigative reporter, um, because I was trying to say maybe we can just do the Bay Area. And, and it was Suki who said, why don't why don't we find why don't we get these records for the whole state of California? And I said, because it's going to be really hard. <laughs> and then we went to our boss and we asked, we called you. Other people got on phone calls. Before the beginning of the year, we had a pretty good um, crew collaboration in place. And then after the beginning of the year, it really grew. So Jack and I work together very closely on <laughs> numerous things. And we're still friends, I think. Um, you know, it was interesting, I think, for us, right, having been through, like, trying to deal with sheriff's records and other things and having to really, like, be, you know, sort of mystery solvers of, you know, they weren't going to give us information. We had to figure out how do we get the information. Did you see an op what, what did you see the opportunity here being? Like, when, I, when, I, we, when we got on the phone and we talked about how we could collaborate, what, what did you see potentially happening? Well, my first reaction was, why would I want to collaborate with any of you guys <laughs> <laughs> you know we've been in cutthroat competition for for years and then suddenly I realized uh oh if there might be a collaboration and we're not in it <laughs> we could really <laughs> and so but then as we started talking more it was uh, Tony Saavedra at the Orange County mm -hmm. Register who had said something to me about how uh, we were just chatting about it I'd called to see if they would be interested in joining and and he said absolutely um, and he said, you know, for 40 years, these records have been secret. And, you know, why wouldn't we just all share what we've got? And Tony and I had competed uh, the, the, when the Orange County Register, when the, Orange, when the Times had an Orange County edition, uh, we were both police reporters and we were, you know, in cutthroat competition with each other. And so to hear my old adversary saying, uh, you know, we should, we should uh, just share our records just was was like a light bulb and I thought oh yeah he's right we should and we could really be you know we could do something powerful because if we could instead of just having like the Bay Area or just Southern California if we could actually pool our resources and say something comprehensive about law enforcement and how discipline is meted out um, or, and how, or not right? yeah right or not or how force is investigated uh, that could be something really meaningful Jeremiah, you mentioned, I mean, you are in a small, scrappy newsroom. I think, when did you guys establish? Dave, David's here, so when did you guys get up and running? It's been it's since June. Yeah, so, so a new newsroom. Last June, not Yeah, a new newsroom, too. So for you, what is the opportunity to join in with all these other newsrooms across the, straight, uh, across the state in terms of what, they, what this gives you access to? And I, I'll, Jeremiah, I think I DM'd on Twitter. I'm like, hey, <laughs> are you interested? And I think the other thing, too, is sometimes there'll be a case in Long Beach, and I'll just contact him, and I'll say, I assume you guys are filing on this. He'll say, yeah. And so that's work that my newsroom is not doing, like that coordination of who's going to take which request, which I think makes it easier for everyone. But I'll let you talk about your newsroom. I, it's, it's, been, it's, been a, it's, it's been huge for us. I think uh, you're right. I was tweeting something about asking for police records, and you just said, hey, you want to join up with us? And yeah, we leapt at the opportunity. But um, I, the, the most concrete example is I think one of the first stories we wrote about uh, this was the, one of the first records the Long Beach Police Department has released about uh, police shootings under SB 1421 is just their 
uh, determinations for each shooting. Before now, the police department in Long Beach wouldn't even tell you whether they dis whether they thought a shooting was in policy or not. We had that little access to their decisions on this stuff. Um, and someone I can't remember exactly who it was at KPCC had KPCC had done it's a request hard for, me to say for too. It's I okay. know had done a request for those uh, uh, basically an outline of police shootings over five, 10 years, and all the policy determinations on it. I don't think you guys ever even did a story on that particular piece of information, but that was a huge piece of information for us to be able to say, here's how many police shootings there have been and their policy determinations and how few, how, how, how infrequent it is for the Long Beach Police Department to find a shooting to be out of policy. And that was the story we did uh, immediately as soon as we got those records from you guys. Well, I'll turn to Dana for the bad news. <laughs> Dana is sort of like, I think of her as like, she's got like the chair and the lion tamer whip and she's trying to get everyone to like actually say what records they've requested and and what the status is, and it's a weekly battle that she sometimes is a little bit grumpy about. But I mean, <laughs> the reality here is it's not like it's not like this dreamland where every single agency in the state has the exact same form that they fill out, and it's all machine readable or it's all already in a computerized form, and we could just like scan it through the magical computer system, and it turns into this beautiful database that gives us all the information we want. Can you tell them a little bit about what the reality is? The reality is that we've got. Um, different departments um, using everything from, I swear, a chisel and a tablet um, <laughs> to machine-readable documents, which are, are rare. We've actually gotten spreadsheets from some departments. They're that technologically advanced. I mean, it's 2019. Um, you'd think that PDFs and spreadsheets would be the norm, not the exception to the rule. Um, but they're all, even though they're all uh, tabulating mostly the same information, uh, field names are different. The forms look different. It's not something that we can readily, um, uh, it's called OCR, uh, like turn a, a PDF into something that's digitized um, because of how the forms are, are laid out so differently. Sometimes we get photocopies of photocopies that are then scanned into the computer. So that may, uh, again, creates another layer of obscurity that the computer then may or may not be able to read. Sometimes we get things that are scanned in crooked. So then we really can't do anything with that. I'm like, OK, this is terrific. Um, so yeah, it's been a it's been a, quite a journey and quite a a struggle some days to just get the basic information. I, I I will say just a shout out to Adrian Hill who's here and she's the one who really wrangled us on all of our calls and I think we have. Does anyone know how many subcommittees we have to try to make this thing work? We have a forum uh, committee. Five. We have a website <laughs> yes. committee. We have a I was steering guess committee. Four. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we have a lot. So we, we're trying to partner with the university. So it's been, you know, sort of all of us in whatever little bit of spare time we can carve out, trying to work across all these different newsrooms to, I think, march towards something that we think could be really powerful and substantial, mm -hmm. which is, you know, this question of what does happen at the, at the um, agency level? Because, I mean, for all we know, there are some departments that, you know, are incredibly disciplined and they have you know, clear standards and they hold people accountable to those standards and the people who don't meet them are you know, dismissed. Um, we don't even know now if those people who are dismissed ended up somewhere else in the state at another you know, organization that maybe doesn't have the same standards or maybe didn't have all the information about what had happened in the person's previous job. And I want Alex to talk about a story you guys had recently about a guy who was at one, one um, I think it was a university Police force? Yeah, yeah. This was an officer who and was... And again, something we would not have known about without 1421. No, and, and um, as a somewhat rare case, this was a case that we, are, we didn't know was coming. Um, part of our strategy has been to build into our initial request. I, I promise I won't get too nerdy on this. Um, but to ask agencies to, you know, give us all your records uh, uh, that, that, that apply, that fall under this law. Um, and as you're working on that, give us an index of cases that uh, you plan to release. And so we had gotten that from San Jose State University, but this case wasn't on the index. And so it was just a normal like the Thursday or Friday afternoon. Um, suddenly we get this, this pretty extensive uh, case file coming from the university um, with video of a really uh, fairly violent, fairly brutal arrest in the university library. Um, an officer was approaching a guy who was looking at pornography on the computer um, 
which is, I think, a fairly common occurrence in a public <laughs> library, unfortunately. But anyway, um, you know, somebody had called police and, and, and you know, there, there was discussion, hey, do you want to go outside? The conversation escalates between the um, subject saying more and more uh, kind of things that weren't really connected to reality. He seems like he may have some, some disconnection going on. And the officer getting more and more frustrated. This ends with a beating, a violent arrest, uh, several broken ribs, fractured orbital eye socket. Um, you know, and, and the police department initially in this case found that the use of force, the arrest, everything was uh, entirely in policy, entirely above board. But because it was a school system, there was um, there is a, another entity above the police department, the university system, in a, in a, in a way. And so when this uh, s uh, subject filed a legal claim, saying, I'm, you know, my rights were violated, I was the victim of uh, excessive force, the university decided to take a look at the body cam footage that the police department had already said showed, you know, a, a perfectly in policy arrest, and then initiated termination proceedings against this officer. Um, so now he's not an officer anymore, For right? excessive force. Well, that stuff takes a while, so it took about a year and a half. He uh, actually won his job back on appeal and would have been hired back by the university, um, but then resigned the very day that he would have returned to work because he got a new job in a neighboring police department in uh, Los Gatos. Um, when we published this story, the community members in that town um, did something that actually doesn't happen all the time in, in my work, where they, they noticed this story and they got, uh, ge it generated outrage and they wanted to do something about it. So there were polls online, there was um, some, some backlash, and uh, this officer has uh, recently left his position at that police department as well. And the one I, I kind of glossed over a piece of this, but this wasn't just a one-off case for this officer. He had a previous uh, excessive force uh, lawsuit settled for um, when he was with San Jose Police Department and he had a similar case that had happened in, in, in Los Gatos as well. So we're seeing this kind of repeat behavior and what transparency can add when the public knows about these cases versus when they're in secret. Jack, you guys published a story this morning. Can you talk a little bit about what you found out there and, and whether you would have known about it? without the new disclosure requirements. Sure, this story is by uh, Maya Lau and Ben Poston, who's in the back there, Ben. Um, and this goes back to uh, stories that they were doing with Karina Knoll, who's now at some New York paper, um, <laughs> back in 2017. Uh, and it was about the Brady List, the Sheriff's Department's Brady List, which the Supreme Court just ruled on recently. Can you tell them what the Brady List is? Yeah, this is a list of officers who have discipline in their past that would that could undermine their credibility if they were to testify in court and the sheriff's department had created this list and notified these deputies that they were on it and that their plan was to present the list to or present the names on the list to prosecutors um, and the union the sheriff's union went to court to block this and it became a big legal battle um, over whether the department and whether police departments if they have such lists can disclose who's on that list to prosecutors, which is crazy when you think about it. But anyway, um, the Supreme Court ruled that they could. Uh, but back in 2017, this was sort of the most secret list in law enforcement, I'd say, in the, in the state. And um, Maya, Ben, and Karina uh, get access to this list. They review who's on it, and uh, they publish a story um, unfortunately, some of the people who were on that list, it was an early version of the list, 2014, um, shouldn't have been on the list. They'd either dis they'd, they'd appealed their discipline and it had been overturned, um, or we found that there were some mistakes with the list, and so we didn't publish everyone who was on it. But there was one guy on there, it was a homicide detective, who had been uh, disciplined, he'd be given a 30-day suspension, which is the longest punishment you can get in the Sheriff's Department without being fired. So a, a lengthy suspension, and it said for false statements, and we were really intrigued by that. And so the reporters did everything they could to find out if there's other ways to get at that information. What had he done? And um, we weren't able to. So come January 1st, uh, Ben and Mai are putting in the requests for, uh, you know, across the state for, for the records under uh, SB 1421, this new transparency law, and eventually, some of the first records 
that they get from the sheriff's department includes a disciplinary letter for this homicide detective, Daniel Morris. And it shows that he had been involved in a car chase uh, back in, you know, the letter was from 2005, so it was a couple of years earlier, he'd been in a car chase. And when the deputies caught up with the guy they were chasing, uh, they bring him out handcuffed and the deputies tell their supervisors that there's been no force used. And eventually, they admit that force had been used, that they'd punched him several times. This is after, of course, he's complained. Um, and the deputies end up getting, well, this Morris at least, ends up getting disciplined for lying. Uh, he claimed that there had been no force, and there had. So he's been going into court as a homicide detective on these murder cases. Some really prominent no, cases, right? Yeah, well, he, right. He's handling some very prominent cases. Um, and, and it'll be interesting to see if this affects that. Uh, one of the cases he's handling is a case that you had referenced earlier, the uh, uh, sheriff's deputy who's charged with manslaughter in an on-duty shooting, the, the first person in the county, first uh, on-duty law enforcement officer to be charged with a, a shooting in, in 20 years. Um, and he's also handling a, a case, he was a lead detective on the case involving uh, a man accused of a string of shootings in Malibu uh, Creek State Park. So, you know, important cases, but he's, be, he's been testifying in murder cases without defense attorneys, prosecutors, and of course jurors uh, having any idea of this. Uh, so, you know, how could they really weigh his credibility? Jeremiah, there's an interesting twist in the Long Beach uh, police contract negotiations, which you guys have been covering. Can you um, explain how that union um, is trying to handle the SB 21, uh, SB 1421? disclosure requirements. Yeah, this actually goes uh, directly to a couple of things you were talking about earlier uh, about how uh, police unions have been trying to undermine or fight uh, some of the disclosure and also uh, how we weigh the privacy of police officers. What pl privacy do they deserve? So um, it, it came to light last week in Long Beach. Uh, the, the, our police union just got a new contract with the city. But um, in reading through that contract, I, I stumbled upon a new provision in their contract that was specifically about SB 1421 that required the city to turn over redacted records that were ready to be released to the public to police officers first to give them five days to review these records, um, which obviously raised questions about why. Um, and, and the union is saying because we want we don't want these officers to be blindsided by uh, this information, but it also gives them the opportunity to try to prevent um, those records from being released if they wanted to try to go to court and get an injunction or that kind of thing. But the thing I think that really got people upset about this was that uh, a provision, there was another provision in there that, that said the city needed to hand over the name of the person who was requesting these records to the officer proactively. So that, that obviously made people worry about uh, retaliation. If I submit a public records request, the, the officer I want to know about is going to know who I am. Now there's ways around that, um, obviously, if, if uh, you want to submit a request anonymously. But they, the other part of this that really got me uh, surprised was that this had been going on since April without anybody knowing about it. So anybody who submitted a public records request to the city of Long Beach for an officer's records, even down to misconduct records, would have their name turned over to this police officer. So obviously the people were upset. They went to the city council meeting and, and said, Why, you're, you're trying to get around SB 1421 or at least uh, intimidating people into not submitting requests. Ultimately, that didn't matter. The city council passed the contract with this provision in it, but I, I was uh, encouraged to see that people were engaged in this process. They actually responded and cared enough to, to, to say something about this. And there is, the city council did do one thing. They made it much easier to submit an anonymous request. So if someone is afraid of retaliation, they can do that much more easily through the city's website to get records. And let me just say, as um, the news media has shrunk, and we don't have as many people covering things. I think it's just, this is such a great example of why it matters that we have people with expertise who are paying attention and reading contracts and you know, getting tips from people. And I, I, I happen to live in Long Beach, as does Jack. It's actually a pretty big city. It just doesn't seem big next to LA. And it had really, I think that the local paper, which had once been pretty robust, is down to maybe two people even you know, attempting to cover the city. So. I just want to thank you guys for what you're doing, and um, yeah. Well, thank you. you know, uh, so this is really interesting what you're raising here, because it, the idea that, that the union then can go into court and prevent people from getting access 
to those records is so insidious because it's a way of preventing, it's pr pr blocking the transparency that was so hard fought for in the first place. And it requires, you know, these shrinking news organizations that you're talking about to shell out each time to, to block them. And whether they're gonna get reimbursed or not is another issue. So it, it's, it's a really uh, damaging thing for transparency uh, when you have when you have this uh, these kinds of clauses, and you have you have the unions going to court to prevent us from getting them. We we actually had that happen uh, in 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 Downey. Uh, there yeah. they uh, there were records set to be released. The city had told us we're ready to release these records, and then a couple of days later came back and said, actually wait, no, a police officer has filed something an injunction to try to stop that, and it actually requested those records be destroyed because they were older than five years old and the city of Downey typically destroys records after five years. So we- Or, or they claim. Yeah. So I, I, uh, KPCC, the LA Times, yeah. and the Long Beach Post all intervened on that lawsuit uh, or intervened in that action and eventually won those records. Well, they still haven't been released. We just still don't have them, but they should be now instead of being destroyed. Dana, if, um, what do you think the challenges are to making this really meaningful in terms of like both the collection of data and then how we work together? I think one of the things that we've noticed is that, you know, we were worried that we would be like scooping each other, but in fact, we have so much stuff that has barely even been looked at. There, there's probably great stories like sitting in our Google Drive somewhere or wherever it is, you know, whatever P drive, I don't even know where it is now. <laughs> so, but I mean, I think what, what do you see as a challenge? Because I think it's hard right now too, because what we talked about, the, the lack of the structured data, it's hard to even know where to look sometimes, mm -hmm. right? You know, it's hard to know, uh, to establish patterns, but that's our hope ultimately. But talk about like how, like you talked a little bit about how messy it is, but what would, what would we need to see to actually use these documents in a way that would be not just like, you know, you're throwing a, a dart at a, at a board and getting the one case that, you know, looks interesting to you. So to give you a scope of sort of how many records we're talking about that we've asked for, to date we've got over 1,300 uh, records requests in. We've gotten back documents on about 480 of them from about 300 different agencies. So we're talking about tons and tons of paper and trees that we've killed. Um, digital trees, sorry. Uh, so I think one of the biggest challenges for us is first of all, just sorting through the information that we're getting um, after sometimes having to nudge and nudge again to say, hey, where are the records? You're sort of out of compliance with the request that I've made. It's been more than the allocated amount of time or you know, whatever, whatever. Um, once we get it, it's a matter of actually getting through all of it and getting through all the different formats for everything. And I think to make it meaningful, um, it's a matter of basically finding the, the least common denominator of all the information so that we can call it all together and make it into uh, something that um, we and the public can actually uh, read and use and explore, which is something that we're working on right now. We're hoping to put together a public-facing database so that the public can go through um, the, the data that we've uh, collected through these records about um, uh, police misconduct and use of force, um, be able to explore by you know officer, by department, and sort of see the patterns and where these officers are working. And um, like uh, Alex talked about, um, where they may leave a department to go to a different department, and they've had this record uh, following them around of different things that they've they've done that nobody's been able to pick up on before because these departments don't necessarily talk to each other like that. Um, and in part, I can understand why because nobody keeps their records in the same way. Um, nobody's filtered through them like this before. So in New Jersey, they did an interesting thing. They did this. Was it, what's it called? The force the report. Force report. And it's. I think it's really. It's really interesting work, and it's ambitious. I think they were working off of standard forms that are required to be yes. uh, filed in all the different police agencies. Yes. But even in that case, I'm left with looking at it, being impressed with the work, but wondering, are we are we measuring um, actual? Discipline? Or are we measuring who's accounting for what happened? You know, and that's the other question. So I'm wondering, Jack. I'll start with you. Like, what big questions in an ideal world with data that was very usable would you want to know or ask of sort of the California law enforcement universe about how how they serve the public? 
Yeah, there's, there's so many, but a, a few that spring to mind. How many cops who have been disciplined for being dishonest have moved on to other departments, and how many of those have continued to be dishonest? Um, how many of those have been testifying in cases without jurors, judges, prosecutors, or defense attorneys knowing? Um, about force, just how many people are killed each year in California by the police, either through being shot or uh, you know, some other altercation, even just simple things like that. And how many of them result in discipline? Um, and then sort of a, a, you know, a qualitative analysis of, of, of what goes into these investigations and how thorough they are. Yeah, that's one of the questions, you know, when in repeat, that was one of the issues, right? We didn't know. Like, had they talked to the witness at what length? You know, had they, if things didn't make sense, had they gone back and questioned them? It's, there, was, there was literally no way to know. And we have a lot of requests out in that case. We did get some things back. We don't have, I think, the responsive documents that go toward the actual um, depositions and interviews that were recorded. We have some paper documents that we started to look at. And we have learned things that we didn't know in the initial uh, efforts to report that story out. Alex, do you have some, I, I know Alex has big questions. Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, I would I would echo um, the uh, dishonesty thing. I want to say that I haven't run these numbers, but if I were to look at all the stories that all of our news organizations have put out so far, I would expect that uh, the dishonesty category might be the smallest number. Um, the, we're, we're not getting a ton of those cases, and they're complicated, and oftentimes they don't necessarily lead to a quick turnaround news story. But I do think that that's going to be a huge one because that kind of that lack of information getting to the prosecution getting to the defense in a criminal case getting to a jury that has the ability to undermine criminal convictions um to basically say that this trial was not was not fair that evidence wasn't uh you know examined in the way that it should be um and so i do think that that has in the in the future once maybe we've collected this information that has uh the possibility to have one of the greatest impacts of, of anything that we're working on. Um, I like the idea of measuring investigations against one another. I have a couple examples in my head. Take, um, take basically the exact same case or the same sort of fact pattern in a case, a use of force case, uh, a fatal officer involved shooting. Um, I can think of an agency where, you know, an a certain type of investigation done around a shooting is 2,000 pages of information, photographs, interview transcripts. And I can think of other agencies where that whole investigation is boiled down to basically a sentence. Um, and so that's the sort of the variation we're seeing in, in, in police departments that for all intents and purposes could be right next to each other. And if you're on one side of that line, there's a very different approach to how seriously this kind of um, investigation is taken. Yeah, and we say here, I mean, our investigative team, sort of the broad mission that we're focused on is the question of how does who you are and where you live affect what kind of justice you get. And I think that's one of the things theoretically we could start to really look at if we're able to more you know you know qualitatively and quantitatively look at how the different agencies perform their job and perform their job of sort of policing themselves one thing i just wanted to mention and i'm going to open it up to questions i'm hoping you guys have some i mean even the fact that like you know you're th this is not you're investigated by your own department oftentimes and especially in smaller departments you're, people you know your colleagues so it's not like they bring in another agency that has you know no vested interest in the outcome to look at the facts of the case and that in and of, of itself is sort of you know both um interesting and potentially troubling right i think in long beach it's uh i i i, I, I wanted to say that i i think just the the fact that police departments know this information is going to become public itself is a huge change. Um, in Long Beach, we've seen them start to proactively release stuff that they have never released in my time there, and that they may not even need to release under this law, but they're going an extra step into putting out things like use of force stats that they just, you had to fight to get before. Um, and, and I think them knowing that someone else is going to be looking over their shoulder and seeing their decision makes a huge difference. Well, we're so glad everyone came out this morning and just looking at the clock, I want to make sure that I know people have probably other things they have to do this morning. We have about 10 minutes, a little more than 10 minutes to answer your questions. I'd like to take a few. Just one second for the mic. Hi, I'm Don and I live up the road a couple of miles. Listen to you, I get the impression 
that the police departments more or less act as individual fiefdoms. And um, without, is it possible without getting too much bureaucracy for the state to set some sort of standards? Uh, this would just make it easier for everybody if they require reports to be in a certain format and procedures to be somewhat the same. Can you do that without unduly tying the police departments in knots? Uh, y y yeah. Well, it, I'm, I'm happy to report that it, it seems like that might be coming. Um, and it isn't that there is no standardization whatsoever. We, all, I think all of us up here do a lot of work with a, a particular state entity, the um, California Commission on Peace Officer Standards and Training, Peace Officer Standards and the training that they receive. Um, interestingly, you know, I have, uh, there's a lot of theories about why SB 1421 may have passed when it did, and, and one of mine that I think contributed to it is that there's uh, another law that you may have heard about that didn't pass last year but just recently did, which changes, has some sort of an effect on the legal standard for when a police officer can use deadly force. Um, I think that that might have distracted or, or split apart the attentions of uh, you know, police union groups, uh, statewide interest groups. Um, but, but why I raise that is because when that use of force bill did pass uh, uh, this year, it also had a companion bill that is going to standardize, that says this Commission on Peace Officers Standards and Training in, in, in the coming years will lay out some specific st uh, uh, standards around how particularly investigations around um, serious uses of force are done. And so we might see uh, a greater level of, uh, you know, standardization, I'm using the same word again, um, that, that and, and, and I think a rise in um, the quality of investigations in, in, in departments that may not be doing them as a result of that law, but it's going to take a couple of years to kick in. Hi, thank you so much for this panel. Um, I was wondering, since we heard from the earlier part of the panel about administrative burden, if you limited the scope of your requests in any way. I, I mean, in this, I think, you know, that was a strategy that I think individual newsrooms talked about and then we talked about across the collaboration. Um, I think that there was a hope in the beginning that some of these indexes could guide us into what would be the most sort of fruitful or, or interesting things. Not everyone had one, not everyone provided one. Um, I think we tried to look at some high value cases, so cases that we had already covered and couldn't get answers on. Those, I think, requests went out. Jack, do you have a... Because we talked a little bit about... We limited the years, too. The years, yeah. yeah. So that's the other thing, too. It's like, if you're going to do a database, you know, this is one of the, the problems. If you're going to be quantitative, you know, you have to have a, a finite universe of things that you're studying. And I think that we have talked about just the sheer effort. So we, we haven't even talked about this, but the reason why we have a form committee is because in order to make this information, this, this data that's included in these voluminous reports, more broadly useful, we have to boil those down to something. It has to be apples to apples, right? So we have to know the same bits of information from each report. And even that, I mean, I, you know, when I was still at the LA Times, we, we, we worked on a project where we were looking at that. And it, it's sort of like this endless, like, well, what about this? Maybe we could capture that piece of information. Um, KPCC actually did it in, in the officer-involved database. And I, I think Aaron maybe drifted out of here. But I mean, that was a tremendous amount of work um, as well. And, and so even like just deciding what information you're gonna capture is like this crazy slippery slope, right? And like the more you require capturing in the first place, the longer it takes to do it. So some of these individual reports, could, it could literally take you hours potentially just to fill in the, the one form. So I think in that sense, that's part of why we're trying to look at like limited years. And maybe we do, you know, a year at a time and we release those as sort of a data set that we have some degree of confidence in. And then we have to look at like, well, where are we gonna get to? Are we gonna get to every single part of the state? I think we have requests in every, in every county at this we point. We have requests in every county to every, every police department and um, I believe every sheriff's department as well. So, you know, those, that information has to come back and it has to be processed. So I think that, you know, we are actively thinking about how do we take pieces of that? I mean, do we start with use of force is probably the hardest and the most voluminous documentation. 
um, you know, dishonesty is another category. We, didn't even, we haven't really talked about sexual assault. But I mean, how, we have to figure out how we compartmentalize it in a way that makes the information useful and, and reliable, because we don't want to be providing. That's my concern with the use of well, the force report, which I think, again, I'm impressed with it. But I'm like, is it measuring actual discipline, or is it measuring which agencies actually complied in the first place with filling out the form? And that's sort of something we're going to have to consider as we, as we move forward. I just wanted to add, in, in addition to limiting our years, we had this index thing. There was uh, asking for decisional letters first. Um, I think that we spent a lot of, of Can time. Can you tell them what a decisional letter is? Well, just the outcome. Just give us give us the piece of paper that shows the, the, the outcome right. as opposed to you know everything that kind of is because they can also bury you in paperwork they can they can send you so much paperwork that in the middle of that is something that's really revelatory and good luck to you finding it but but i want to say that it, it, it while we tried really hard to 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 make it manageable on kind of both ends of this thing it ended up not mattering um because there are other entities out there that are also seeking these requests and i think that we get bundled in with them our our collaboration does and I know of, you know, there's a place that's put in these requests everywhere um, for, for 20 years back. So I'm like, I scratched my head, like, why did I just get a record from 1998? Yeah. Well, it's because somebody else asked for it. Um, so one of the things that you were talking about is, you know, you're putting together this collaboration, so there's no more concern about, okay, well, are they going to find out what, you know, records requests I put out there that I didn't want, pe that I didn't want the other newsrooms to know about? And on top of that, when it came to um, Jeremiah's time to talk about the Long Beach five-day rule, it's kind of, it is really concerning when you see, like, there's an opportunity to intimidate somebody who files that out. So it's one of those, if you're in a collaborative situation, is there a way to maybe make it enough of almost a form sheet where like, you know, ordinary citizens can just rubber stamp a similar version of the request and then it's almost like brigading to the point where there's so many people in this five day window that they can't come and contact them all and try to <laughs> ask all the uncomfortable questions. It, it, it's funny you ask that. We actually uh, were in the process of building a form to do that. Uh, our, our tech guy whipped it up in a couple days, but as soon as we were getting ready to, you know, actually decide whether or not we we're going to make it go live and take on that responsibility, the city council basically did it themselves. So I, I, there, there may be a, a broader discussion to have about that, um, but we've, we did definitely think about that in Long Beach, but maybe it applies elsewhere too. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, yeah, I was curious from the police um, side of things, if anybody's been able to establish kind of, if there's any, any police people who have come forward supporting this in any way, just kind of stepping out of the standard position, which would be defensive, or if it's always an adversarial, if it seems to be that they're always taking it in an adversarial way. Uh, well, uh organizations or reporters like just relationships with the cops when you're trying to follow up on this stuff if anybody comes forward saying anything that isn't just like the standard line you know or leaks people who provide cops who provide inside information uh, I, I got a couple of quick examples one is is a broad one which is that um, one of the other reasons that I think SB 1421 passed when it did is that the the uh, California Police Chiefs Association did not oppose it. They did initially. They kind of came around. I can't remember if they were neutral or, or, or in favor, but it was enough of a, a kind of getting on board. And so that that's, that lays out kind of one distinction between your line level officers and your police managers, your your, your top brass, who actually do have. I, I feel like police chiefs and uh, some some higher ranking officers do have an interest in themselves knowing this kind of information about their their own employees and uh the laws in california have made it so secret that that can that police agencies may not know that about um employees of other agencies for instance uh, that's one example and then I, I have another specific one where there was um we did uh this was a credit to, to suki lewis again she did a um, major investigation around domestic violence we were getting some records on um, police officers who uh you know abuse their partners um, and 
one of the uh, one of the best I think sources of information for that story was a retired uh, domestic violence and homicide investigator in in uh, who had spent the bulk of his career in San Francisco, and when when you know it took a little time for us to find him find find this right person to talk, but when when he was finally on the other end of the, of the line, he was thanking us profusely for looking under this rock that he had spent his whole career under and been manipulated by his own department to basically um, uh, uh, to undermine investigations about domestic violence by his colleagues. I think we have time for one last question. Thanks. Of course. Yeah, also on the topic of uh, the administrative burden and trying to filter your request to make that a little more feasible, uh, I was wondering how feasible is it to filter them um, not by a specific officer or by a specific incident, but by other attributes uh, of these kind of things. So for instance, like what disciplinary reports are associated with a particular street or something maybe a little more realistic for say the sheriff's department, trying to filter reports by those that mention uh, specific gangs like the Jump Out Boys or uh, the Vikings or, or you know other gangs within the sheriff's department. Is it actually feasible to do a request like that? It all depends on how the department keeps their own records. So in, in Long Beach, they've been talking about how they've gone back by hand through decades of information to even figure out what is uh, now accessible under SB 1421. I doubt they actually have much of a concept of what specific words or locations are in those reports. So it may, it may not actually help that much, but it depends on the department. Well, thank you guys so much for coming out this morning. It's been a real pleasure to have this conversation.